there's a new ransomware attack that's being used in AWS that you need to know about. We're gonna be covering everything from what it is and how it works to doing a live demonstration. And we'll also talk about defenses to prevent this attack. And finally, I'll save the best for last. I'll show you a couple of tools that you can use to test and then see if your environments are vulnerable. So let's imagine this scenario. Let's say that you have an organization that's storing a bunch of critical data in Amazon S3 within their AWS accounts. A threat actor gains access to those S3 buckets and that data, and then they start to encrypt it. They will then leave a ransom note and give the victims seven days to pay, or else they'll either delete the data or they'll publish it to the internet. But how is this possible? How do we actually get to that point? Well, we're gonna be talking about two variations of this attack, and the first requires that you know a little bit about the AWS service called Key Management Service, or KMS for short. KMS can be used to create and manage encryption keys, and then you can use those keys to encrypt your data in AWS environments. So AWS customers use KMS all the time and for all sorts of encryption of data, including Amazon S3 data. That's not uncommon at all, and in fact, it is a recommended best practice. But the problem is that threat actors figured out that they could take KMS and then turn it against victims for ransomware purposes. They'll actually encrypt the data using KMS from their own attacker controlled account, and then they'll prevent decryption access to the victim unless they pay. So that's attack technique number one, which we'll demonstrate in just a minute. But a second technique uses something called server-side encryption using client-provided keys. And this approach is quite different from the first, so we'll also break that down. Real quick though, at the beginning, I said that it was a new attack with air quotes because it's not really a new attack technique at all. It's just actively being exploited in the wild all of a sudden, which is why people are talking about it. That's why it's in the news lately. But otherwise, this technique was shared a while ago by a security researcher named Spencer Geetzen, hopefully I'm saying that name correctly, as well as security firm Rhino Security Labs. But regardless, it's happening now and it's making the news, so we'll probably see more copycats. Okay, so let's get started and let's actually walk through step by step how this attack would go down. And also just to clarify, I'm showing you this purely for educational purposes and so that we can understand effective defenses. Do not do any of this against accounts that you don't have explicit permissions for. So let's get started with attack technique number one. By default, an S3 bucket uses SSE-S3 for encryption, which uses an Amazon S3 managed key, which means that it's created, it's managed, and it's used on behalf or on your behalf by the S3 service. However, you can also select server-side encryption with AWS KMS keys or SSE-KMS for short. So an attacker, once they gain access to this account, they can go to the bucket's properties and then they can edit the encryption settings. And they would select the SSE KMS option and then specify their own KMS key. Now, as long as this key resides in the same region as the bucket, it can be from a totally different account. It can be from an attacker controlled account. So in another window, I'm authenticated in a separate AWS account entirely and will pretend that this is my attacker controlled environment. I can go to the KMS service and I've already created a key for demonstration so I can click on it and then I can grab its ARN value, its unique identifier. Then I'll go back to the S3 bucket in the victim account and I'll set that as the encryption key by pasting in that ARN value. So this key was created with a policy allowing the victim to encrypt data that's uploaded to S3, but they don't have permissions to then decrypt the data. They only have encryption permissions. Now let's upload a file to this bucket and then let's try to retrieve it to demonstrate what would actually happen in real life. So I'll upload one of my S3 least privileged cheat sheets, which I figured would be quite relevant here. And then once I've uploaded it, if I try to download it, I'll then get an access denied error because I don't have access to perform the KMS decrypt action. The only way for me to retrieve this data is if the attacker gives me decryption access. Now, if you want to learn more about how S3 KMS encryption works, we have two hands-on labs at Cyber that the first one will show how to encrypt S3 data with SSE KMS using the AWS console. And then the second shows how to do this through the CLI so that you can automate it 
or use it in scripts and things like that. So that's one way that this attack can unfold, but a second way would be using server-side encryption with client-provided keys or SSE-C for short. With SSE-C, you can store data encrypted with your own local encryption keys so that when you upload an object, S3 will actually use that encryption key to apply AES-256 encryption. So when you go to retrieve that object, you have to provide the same encryption key in order to be able to download and view that object. So basically, whoever controls the key controls the data itself, and that's how an attacker can take advantage of that. Again, if you want to learn how SSE-C works hands-on, I've got a hands-on lab where you can learn how to encrypt S3 data with SSE-C via the CLI in our own environments so that you don't worry about messing anything up or about costs. Okay, but at this point, you might be asking yourself, well, aren't these attacks just for newly uploaded files? Well, no, because if an attacker has enough permissions to upload data, they can use the AWS API to replace each object in a bucket with a new copy of itself, regardless of which technique we're talking about. But this time, it will get encrypted with the attacker's KMS key or with their own client key. And that can happen extremely quickly depending on how much data we're talking about. In fact, it can happen so quickly that your threat detection software or solution may not even fire off any alerts by the time the attack is already over. So you don't even get a chance to respond. Okay, so I'm sure by this point you're like, okay, this sounds like doom and gloom, we're screwed. Uh, but defending against this is actually quite easy. So let's talk about the root cause defenses and then I'll mention some other security controls. First and foremost, stop using long-term access keys and IAM users, which is something that I say in every single one of these videos because most breaches still happen due to long-term access keys getting stolen. I have a blog post that's free that you can check out and that can help you with how to get rid of access keys and IAM users. Second, you want to ensure that S3 buckets are not misconfigured and they should follow the principle of least privilege. This is a little bit more complicated than the first one, but we're here to help you with that. And it's definitely gotten a lot easier now with, with default security controls pushed by AWS. Now, next, let's talk about additional security controls that we can implement on top of those first two that I mentioned. First, you want to turn on S3 object versioning with MFA delete enabled. This requires having MFA to disable versioning and to delete an object version. So you can retrieve the unencrypted version of that object and basically bypass the ransomware attack entirely. Number two, you want to consider using S3 object lock, especially with your backups. That way those objects cannot be encrypted or deleted, which again, bypasses the attack entirely. And speaking of backups, number three is to make sure that you actually have them. And ideally, they should be in a different AWS account entirely, a different region, and offsite as well. But of course, depends on your policies. And number four, I think you could also use SCPs and RCPs in this situation to require specific encryption and encryption that's not external to your accounts. I'd have to test that out. I haven't actually done that yet and make sure that this is practical advice, uh, but it's a thought that crossed my mind as I was making this video. Now, AWS has also implemented automatic mitigations according to their blog post, but that's definitely not going to block everything. So don't just rely on that. That's just extra help. And they also mentioned blocking the use of SSE-C unless it's required by your application. That's probably fine if you never plan on using that. But as we saw, it's not going to prevent this attack entirely. That first technique doesn't even use that. So uh, maybe it's completely up to you, uh, but it's definitely not going to be your primary fix. That would be one of the last things that I would implement. Now, before we wrap up, I promised and I want to share two different tools that you can use to test your effectiveness at preventing and at responding to this threat. The first is a script by Spencer, who helped discover this a while ago, and this script will execute the first attack technique that we discussed. And the second tool is going to be an attack simulation tool called Stratus Red Team. They have multiple S3 ransomware scenarios, including one for client-side encryption. I've actually got a couple of hands-on labs that you can test this out with in our own environments. And we also have a hands-on lab for the S3 ransomware through batch file deletion simulation that you can access here. That way you can try these attacks safely in our accounts first, and then you can test them against your own defenses in your own accounts. But that's it. That's what's going on with these attacks. You now know what they are, how to prevent them, and then how to test your defenses. If you found this video helpful, please let me know in the comments below. Please leave a like and consider subscribing. 
Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.